Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. One thing before we start the show. I want to let you know about a special interview you'll hear at the end of this episode. It's with the host of a brand new podcast called Art Architects, the architects of art. The cool thing is this show is hosted by Director X and Taj Critchlow, two of the biggest music video directors on the planet. These guys are responsible for game-changing videos from artists like Drake and Coldplay and Kendrick Lamar and so many more. Hope you enjoyed the discussion. I sure did. That's coming up at the end of this episode. All right, let's get on with things. Dancing is as old as the human race. Not long after we started walking on two legs, we found a groove and have been moving to the music ever since. Fast forward several million years, and we find that wherever there's music, there's dancing that goes along with it. Okay, so maybe they didn't exactly bust a move to medieval hymns and Gothic cathedrals, but there at least had to be some swaying going on. We can't help but move to music. Scientists have documented connections between the oral cortex and the movement centers of our brain. The millisecond we hear music, the motor cortex lights up, indicating a relationship between music, emotion, and the need to move in time with the music. In other words, we seem to be pre-wired to dance. Not dancing, or at least moving to music in some way, is unnatural. This caused some problems with some rock fans in the 1970s. Dancing was seen as uncool, unless you were pogoing or slam dancing to a punk band. And when disco came along, the most uncool music and music scene of all, dancing, for a while, was almost a crime. What were you, some disco weirdo? Fortunately, that moratorium on dancing did not last long. The music and music fans needed to evolve to another level. And when that happened, dancing became not just okay, but it was cool once again. This is a look at how that happened in the years immediately following the punk rock of the 1970s. It's part four of the post-punk explosion, and it's all about what we'll call alt-dance. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is the next episode in our exploration of all the alternative music that sprang out of the original punk rock era of the 1970s. It was the time of the Great Fracturing, where music, freed by the the do-whatever-the-hell-you-like ethos of punk, was able to ride off in all directions at once, with some very thrilling results. Now, to recap, we've discussed the rise of New Wave, the subset known as Technopop, and its heavy offshoot industrial music. And now we're going to look at how it became cool for the cool kids to dance again. If you were of age musically in the late 1970s, you'll know that the world was awash in disco music. It was everywhere, especially on the radio. At one point, the Bee Gees had five songs in the top 10 on the charts, making Barry Gibbs falsetto annoyingly ubiquitous. Disco was also seen as exclusionary. If you weren't pretty enough or dressed in the right high-end clothes, you were not allowed. Clubs hired doormen to make sure only the beautiful people were allowed in. And that drumbeat, boom, 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 just monotonous and dull. Now, to be fair, there were many good things about it. We could talk for hours how important this music was to the liberation of gay and certain minority groups. And there were some excellent musicians and some excellent songs in the mix. Disco was so huge that it drove the culture for a couple of years. But it became too much. Too much Bee Gees, for one. Too much decadence, especially with the drugs and the sex and the bad behavior in those super exclusive clubs. That did not go over well when a massive global recession hit at the end of the 1970s. These rich and beautiful people were having so much fun and so much sex and so many drugs when everyone else was worrying about paying the mortgage with interest rates over 20%. And the record industry got so deep into disco that a lot of bad records were made. There was too much disco. And the backlash was intense. There was even an anti-disco riot in Chicago in the summer of 1979, the infamous Disco Destruction Night. All this led to the disco craze crashing and burning by 1980, sending the entire recorded industry into the abyss. Radio stations that had gone all disco changed formats, and labels that had hitched their wagon to disco went bankrupt. It would take the rise of MTV in 1981 and the introduction of the compact disc in early 1983 to repair all this damage. 
It took a couple of years for the stigma of dancing in a club to go away. And this is where the post-punk folks come in again, beginning with what became known as post-disco. I mean, that's what it was, right? Before we go much further, we need, again, to acknowledge Kraftwerk, the all-electronic band from Dusseldorf in what was then West Germany. Starting in the early 70s, they set about creating some cold, robotic, minimalist, futuristic, and sometimes pessimistic and dystopian sounds that would end up laying the foundations for everything from technopop to industrial music to hip-hop to, yeah, even disco in the years ahead. This is from 1975. If you've been following our post-punk story in this series, you can hear all the elements of all sorts of future music in what Kraftwerk was doing with their synthesizers and rhythm machines as far back as 1975. They, and their fans, even became something of a meme. Remember Sprockets with Dieter from Saturday Night Live? Welcome to Sprockets! I am your host, Dieter! Lore has it that Mike Myers was inspired to create Dieter by a waiter at a venue called the Cameron House in Toronto. The theme for the sketch was a Kraftwerk song played on the wrong speed. And Dieter's monkey, Klaus, was named after the avant-garde singer Klaus Nomi. Speaking of which, would you like to touch my monkey? Mm. Touch him! Love him! Leave him on out, Sminky! Now's the time on Sprocket for me, die! The Technopop kids got into dancing too, especially in the UK where a new scene called New Romantics took hold in a few clubs in London, Birmingham, and Liverpool in the late 1970s. They had names like the Blitz Club, Billy's, and Eric's. This music was greatly influenced by David Bowie and Roxy Music, not only in sound, but, and this is really important, a sense of fashion that blended the anything-goes attitude of punk with glam rock, with looks from the Romantic period of England, hence the name New Romantics. So, think of how the dandies dressed in the late 18th and early 19th century. In other words, Way over-the-top dress, combined with makeup, wild hairstyles, and not a little gender-bending. Other names for followers included peacock punks, the futurists, and the cult with no name. And, crucially, electronic dance music. So, yeah, even as far back as 1980, some of these musical groups referred to what they were doing as EDM. It's important to understand that this sound started as a fashion first and as a backlash against the austere anti-fashion attitude of the punks. Just so happens that some of the adherents decided to get into music, and this was the origin of such groups as Duran Duran, Culture Club, Spando Ballet, and A Flock of Seagulls. We could also loop Bowie himself into this scene, although he had no direct connection with it. The sound of his 1979 album Lodger, and especially his 1980 record Scary Monsters and Super Creeps, were massive influences on the young New Romantics. A great example of New Romantic music is Visage, headed up by Steve Strange. He was a punk who moved into dancey synth stuff like this. The new romantic scene mutated rapidly. Fashion moved from the outrageous to sharp suits. And other groups benefited from a peripheral association with the original members of the scene. That would include Ultravox, Japan, and Adam Ant. But because of that rapid mutation, it pretty much burned out by 1982. But you can see what happened here. Dance music made a comeback. It wasn't uncool disco that had been exploited to death by record labels in the mainstream. This was cool underground dance music that welcomed outsiders and weirdos. And the clubs in which this music thrived were in sharp contrast to the glitzy discotheques like Studio 54. Some of this new dance momentum peeled off into something called post-disco. I mentioned that before. And this had plenty of pop and R&B elements. Madonna was part of post-disco early in her career. So was Prince. Michael Jackson's Thriller could be looked at as post-disco. And again, we can throw Bowie into the mix with his Let's Dance album from 1983. It was produced by Nile Rodgers, the guy behind Chic, one of the better disco bands in the late 1970s. Would break my heart in two If you should fall into my arms Tremble like a flower 
David Bowie straddling the lines between alternative, post-disco, and alt-dance in 1983. And Let's Dance was the biggest album of his career. There are a few other alt-dance pioneers that require our attention, and they are coming up next. This is part four of our look at the sounds that came out of the post-punk era, which is to say that incredible period from about 1978 through to, let's say, the middle 80s. And this time we're focusing on alt-dance, the sounds that made it cool to dance again following the death of disco. This is where we need to acknowledge Grace Jones, the Jamaican model, singer, record producer, songwriter, and actress. Her personality and image was such that she was at home in any kind of club anywhere in the world that played any kind of dance music. Jones started with disco, but then moved towards a style that was heavily influenced by new wave, the post-punk scene, funk, technopop, and reggae. Her influence extends not just to followers such as Annie Lennox of the Eurythmics, but all the way through Madonna, Lady Gaga, Rihanna, and Lord. You could even make a case for her being a major influence on the drag queen and cross-dressing scene. Powerful woman. And here's the kind of stuff she was making for dance clubs in the early 1980s. cool, slinky, and just outside of the mainstream enough to work with the alternative crowd in their non-disco dance clubs, especially in the UK. And now we have to move on to something else. A lot of credit for the post-punk dance sound has to go to New Order. When Joy Division singer Ian Curtis died in May 1980, the band added a keyboard player and reorganized itself into New Order. Now, at first, New Order sounded a lot like Joy Division which is to say they play dark, guitar-driven stuff. But they very soon started bringing in synth-pop sounds that owed more to a nod to Kraftwerk and a few other German bands. With each passing day, New Order added more electronics, drum machines, synthesizers, samplers. And they were also fascinated by the dance sounds coming out of clubs in New York and Chicago. And this is where they learned about post-disco, the growing house music movement, and various types of electro. They also started to listen to dance music out of Italy, which had its own feel. At the same time, drummer Stephen Morris began to learn how to program the new generation of drum machines, which allowed the band to experiment with more complex rhythms. This worked for both them and their growing fan base. And by the time they released their Power, Corruption, and Lies album in 1983, they were all in when it came to the dance floor. Then came the monster, Blue Monday. It finished building the bridge. New Order had been working on between what had come before with punk and this new type of alternative dance music. That became the biggest selling 12-inch single in history. It was a landmark in post-disco synth pop and the fast-growing alternative dance scene. And yet, because the packaging of the 12-inch was so expensive, New Order actually lost money on every copy sold. Which is not really surprising because New Order wasn't very good with their money. They made some really bad investments. On May 21st, 1982, they opened their own dance club, the infamous Hacienda on Whitworth Street West in Manchester. It was so expensive to build and maintain, and so poorly run, that the band lost millions of pounds on the venture. That is not an exaggeration. They had to keep releasing music and touring just to subsidize running their club. But the Hacienda was ground zero for alt dance. Yes, bands played there, but the Hacienda's most important role was its elevation of the rise of the DJ as the star. And this was all part of the explosion in dance culture across the UK leading to everything from Manchester to whatever it was the Prodigy and the Chemical Brothers would end up doing. The Hacienda was eventually overrun by drugs and gangs and violence. It lost its liquor license in the summer of 1997, which forced it to close forever on June the 23rd of that year. It was torn down in 2002, and a block of condos now stands where people once came by the thousands to dance. But while in operation, the Hacienda helped drive a boom in dance music across the UK. A string of singles kept coming. Many were from faceless DJs, and many were one-hit wonders. All that mattered, though, was keeping the dance floor moving. (laughs) 
By the middle 80s, dance music was back in a big way. New alternative clubs played danceable stuff for alternative fans. Acid House, with its bass lines from Roland TB303 synthesizers and TR-808 drum machines. We'd soon see things fracture into techno, trance, jungle, big beat, breakbeat, hardcore, drums and bass, trip-hop, electronic body music, and a million different types of house music, each with its own production aesthetics. And it wasn't just in the UK. The Spanish islands of Ibiza, throughout Italy, New York, Chicago, LA, Toronto, became a massive center of techno culture. But very little of this music made it to mainstream radio, which is just how fans liked it. This was stuff by the underground for the underground, though its music did bubble up through new music, affecting everyone from Bjork to U2. And we could spend hours and hours taking all that apart. But to wrap up, I'd like to look at a type of record that made this possible. And that's coming up next. Before we finish up this program on the birth of alt dance in the post-punk years, we need to discuss the role and the importance of the 12-inch single and the music that came with it. In the early days, DJs would mix 45 RPM records. But when disco appeared, there was a demand for keeping the groove going longer than what appeared on the 45. So what DJs and dancers wanted was an extended version of the song with an emphasis on adding additional segments of dance beats. This served two functions. First of all, it kept the dancers dancing. And secondly, the additional beats allowed for easier and more interesting beat mixing, where the DJ seamlessly segued between songs, allowing for non-stop movement on the dance floor. The result was a 12-inch slab of vinyl with one extended song per side. They usually played at 45 RPM and were cut with wider and deeper grooves. That meant the grooves could store more information, translating into louder and more powerful playback, especially, and this is important, with deep bass. The inventor of the 12-inch was Tom Moulton, and his invention was a mistake. He wasn't a DJ, he wasn't a musician. He did know, however, how to extend songs by adding these important additional beats. Normally, he cut these mixes onto 7-inch singles, but one weekend, he was on a very tight deadline and had run out of 7-inch blanks. With no other choice, he used some 12-inch blanks that he had in stock, stretching out the groove so they filled as much space as possible. The name of this first 12-inch record, the first record done this way, was I'll Be Holding On by Al Dowling. This was 1974. At first, these were called disco discs because they were designed for old-school discos. DJs liked them a lot because they were easier to handle than the smaller 7-inch singles. And once very-speed turntables became more prevalent, like the amazing Techniques SL1200, which was introduced in 1972, mixing records went to a whole new level, a whole new direction. When disco died, the 12-inch single lived on. People still wanted to dance, no matter what the genre of music. In the early 80s, everybody was doing it. I remember having a drink in some rock bar when a special dance mix of ZZ Top's Legs came on. This was 1982. What the hell is going on here? That goes on for nearly eight minutes, almost twice the length of the regular album cut. And some rock fans had a hard time with songs like this. But technopop fans and those into various segments of the growing alternative scene loved these extended mixes. Groups into an industrial sound, which also could be danceable, also went the 12-inch route. Same thing with many goth acts. Depending on who we're talking about, the 12-inch single extended mixes were often preferred over the original ones. And the more time passed, the more creative the remixers became. You could still make a very good living remixing other people's music. Some acts jumped into the 12-inch world more than others. I once asked Martin Gore of Depeche Mode how many 12-inch mixes there were of their version of Strange Love. He just shrugged his shoulders and said, I have no bloody idea, mate.
What we just heard should not be taken as the definitive history of alt dance in the 1980s. We could have gone down so many routes, including how Tecto came out of Detroit, the greater long-term effects of House, and a deep dive into the rise of British rave culture. This was just an overview. But although we barely skimmed the surface of the history of modern dance music, I think we've covered how dancing became cool again for the cool kids after the demise of disco, that is, on the alternative side of things. On episode five, we'll look at another big sound that emerged from the ashes of punk. And this genre was a long time coming, since uh, 1818, in fact. We'll look at the birth of goth. Meanwhile, podcasts for hundreds of these shows are available through every single podcast platform in the known universe. Just download and go. Everything is free. We can run into each other on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And there's my website, ajournalofmusicalthings.com. Get the free newsletter while you're there. And finally, my email is alan at alancross.ca. Should you wish to talk, feel free to use it. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. Talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. Before we leave today's Ongoing History of New Music podcast, uh, I want you to know that we're part of a network called Curious Cast. And Curious Cast has a lot of podcasts available on its network. And one of the new ones is called Art Catex. And I have two of the hosts of Art Catex with me here. Uh, we have Taj Krishlow and Director X. And we want to give you a bit of a, an introduction to what this new podcast is all about. So who wants to go first and explain exactly what you guys will be doing? And obviously, here's a hint. If you're at the end of this podcast, my podcast, Chance Start has something to do with music. So our show is pretty much about... It's in the world of music. It's pretty much us sitting down with uh, storytellers that come from music videos. Uh, I feel like we live in a world where we don't give these these amazing creative uh, artists uh, the flowers they deserve. They create some of the most uh, impactful uh, content on the planet that gets a lot of eyeballs on it. And coming from the world of music video, being in the business for over 20 years, we felt it was necessary to create a show like Architects, do you sit down and hear their stories, their come ups, their journey, their process of creating some of the most iconic music videos, films, and content on the planet? Now, you guys have been deeply involved in this world for, like you say, a long time. Who have you worked with? I've directed videos for Alicia Keys, Puff Daddy, Cisco, uh, uh, Destiny's Child, Drake, Justin Bieber, Two Chains. Rosalia, Iggy Azalea, Sean Paul, Beanie Man, um, Ariana Grande. Uh, well, you know. Okay, uh, now, now now you're just bragging. Corn, <laughs> <laughs> John Mayer, the list goes on. Like we, this has literally been um, a crazy journey, and and I would say X is the goat because as long as he's been doing it, like like late '90s to now. It's still relevant, you know. Like we broke our our production company fella with uh, this music video for uh, for DJ Khaled, Drake, and Bieber called Pop Star. So it's 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 been a crazy journey, and um, and we're two kids from Brampton, Ontario, that uh, went out to you know make art that broke out to the world, and now we're using our podcast as another form of storytelling, but through an audio uh, medium. Okay. How are you going to make that transition? You've been telling stories through video. Now it's going to be only audio. So uh, you're going to have to change your style a little bit, I guess. I mean, we're talking to the creator, so it's a different kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, the, the story is the story of the maker. So it's not conceptualizing music and visuals to it. It's talking like the last, the first podcast, the debut of our of the show was with Dave Myers. Um, another guy that's been in the game for a long, long time. And just talking about that, the philosophy behind his approach to art, the work he's done. And, you know, as well, digging into some of the larger world issues out there. Like we have a whole talk about black lives matter, uh, on that podcast and being a white director and his perspective coming up in a black music, uh, 
world. So it's just a, it's a little different than what we're used to doing. Without any spoilers, give me the kind of stories that you'll be telling. Give me an example of a story. I guess the examples is pretty much their come up. Um, what they, what gravity, what, what drew them in to get into this world of uh, filmmaking, um, their influences, um, their highs, their lows, and pretty much their breakthrough moment. And, and a lot of times, to your point, um, Alan, like when you watch a music video, you're just seeing the end result, but you don't see what, what went into to make that product and, and that, that piece of art as far as the storyboards and the, the art direction and sitting down with your head department and the collaboration. So it's pretty much we're, we're, we're giving them that kind of you know, close set behind experience where you get to see the process of how uh, we get to the finish line, right? Because I've I've always I've often watched music videos and wondered where the hell did this come from? What kind <laughs> of headspace do you have to be in to come up with these images, these storylines, these you know things? Uh, and and I have no idea. Yeah, it's it's and that's the point of the show. Like, look, we're probably like around the same age. Like, I came up, I came up in the '80s era where that's what made me fall in love with music videos, right? The MTV much music era, watching videos by like Madonna and Peter Gabriel and like Phil Collins and and Michael Jackson and uh, uh, and Aerosmith, and I was always fascinated by music videos and the storytelling and the dancing and the style and all that stuff. And that's what got that's what made us fall in love with the art. So imagine if you could go back in the days and sit down with Duran Duran and talk about the hungry like a wolf video. Like what the hell compelled you guys to be in this jungle and 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 just going through this crazy, crazy story and sitting down with like the best of the best and hearing their the stories of the directors working with Madonna and working with the Stones. And that's the beauty about the show. It's like we get that access to these filmmakers, to these artists. I've worked with the biggest and brightest artists in the entertainment business, but learn about that journey, that creative journey, that collaboration to make the work that we see that's now on television or on YouTube. And and before we jump, I just want to say please follow us at Architects Pods. Uh, I can't wait for this. Sounds like a great series. Looking forward to it. It's called Art Architects with Karina Evans, Taj Critchlow, and Director X. And uh, I can't wait to hear some of these stories. Thank you so much, you guys. All right.